so many churches. But anyway, we're just delighted to have you. Now, folks, let me tell you just really quickly a little bit about this great brother we have with us. He preaches uh, for the Lakeside Church of Christ in uh, Orange Park, Florida. He's married to Rebecca, and they have two children. As the fellow said, one of all kind. You've got a daughter right. and a son. Uh, <laughs> they have Maggie. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, now, I don't want to get too much into this because we don't take the time. But I assume she's after your grandmother. That's uh, right. Named uh, after my grandmother, Maggie. Uh, you know, your grandfather, uh, your grandmother, and your mother all have spoken, of course, at Lithia Springs. But That's great. He's got a daughter, Maggie. He's got a son, six months old, Ellis. Uh, now, in addition to this, this guy's well-educated, folks. Uh, so listen up. He's not only got he's got two bachelor's degree, one master's, and he's getting another December, another master's, correct? In That's December. right. That's right. And he has a Ph.D. degree, and so it's just a great blessing to have uh, someone like you. We we appreciate you. Well, thank, thank you, you for very having much. Me. We appreciate. Let me just say this: I appreciate your knowledge. But I appreciate the way you present it. It's just great. Now today, we're going to talk about the church. Great. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word. They might present to himself a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We're combining that with Hebrews 10.24 and 25, which right. talks about our... Not forsaking the assembly, our encouraging one another. What is the meaning? What 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 is the meaning of the word church? No. Well, the word that's translated church in the New Testament, and I guess all of your viewers are aware that the New Testament was originally written in Greek. Yeah. And so we have a good English translation, many good English translations of that original language. Well, there's a Greek word translated church that's ekklesia. And it, it literally means the ones who are called out. Um, in this case, the ones who are called out from the world. And Jesus used that kind of phraseology in John seventeen six mm -hmm. when he said that God had given him those disciples whom he had called out of the world. And so the church refers to the group of people who have been set apart for God's purposes. You quoted Ephesians five twenty five mm -hmm. beginning about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having washed her by the water, cleansed her with the word. Well, the church then is the cleanse. The church is the sanctified. Mm -hmm. The church is God's group of people that have been set apart from the world. So in short, we could just say the church is the group of the saved. All the saved are members of the church, and all the lost are not members of the church. That's simply what the word refers to in the religious context of the New Testament. Well, I think it, I think when folks understand, I like to liken it to if you had a if you had a, a if you're going from one point to another, yeah. You have a bus or a train or a plane, whatever you're using, mm -hmm. you've got to be in that to get from one point to the other. Mm -hmm. Okay, our point is we're going from the earth to heaven. That's our goal. Right. So there is a vehicle that yes. takes us there, and so. That vehicle is the church. I mean, I mean, that's what we're looking at, is it not? That's right. That's the group, according to the passage you yeah. just quoted, that will be delivered up to the Father at the end of time. Yeah. And Paul goes into that in 1 Corinthians 15 uh -huh. as well, that at the end of time when that great resurrection occurs, the Christians are the ones who are going to go to heaven, the ones who are in the church, the ones who are in Christ, right. to use the terminology of Galatians 3.27. Well, you know... When you break it down for us as it is, and in, in Acts 2.47, yes. the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved or those that were being saved. Would you break down for us how the church in terms of the universal, in terms of local and the sense, how do you break that down? Well, the sense that we've been using the word church so far refers to the universal church or the global church. All of the saved people in the world are members of that body. And so each viewer needs mm -hmm. to ask him or herself today, am I a member of the worldwide body of Christ? Have I done what the New Testament says I need to do in order to get my sins washed away, to be cleansed? 
And I'm sure that you have well covered the New Testament plan of salvation in other episodes of this show where you've shown that a person needs to believe in Jesus because Jesus said, unless you believe I'm He, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. And then a person needs to repent of sins, to turn away Mm -hmm. from doing what's wrong and to do what's right, to follow the Lord because Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And Peter said, repent in Acts 2, 38. And then we must be baptized in order to have our sins washed away. Peter said, repent and be baptized and wash away your sins or repent and be baptized calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16, Saul was told to do. Be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. So that's the New Testament plan of salvation. So we've got to follow that. And if we do, our sins will be washed away and we will be, as you said, from Acts 2, 47, added to that body of, of believers. That's the universal sense. But now, the New Testament also uses that word ecclesia to refer to a local chapter of that Mm -hmm. universal church, or we might say a local congregation of that worldwide body of Christ. For example, in Romans 16, 16, the Apostle Paul said, the churches of Christ salute you or greet you. Well, obviously, Paul is writing on behalf of some churches who are greeting some people who are members of other churches in another place. That should signify to us that there's a different sense in which church is being used to refer to local groups. Or in Acts 14.23, we read about Paul and Barnabas traveling around and appointing elders Mm -hmm. for congregations in, in every area. Here they are going through and every church has elders that are appointed as the leaders over those congregations. So there's a local sense where there's one body. Or we might think of Matthew 18, 15 through 17, where Jesus talks about how to resolve interpersonal conflict, where one person has sinned against another person. And Jesus goes through a three-step process of trying to get reconciliation to occur. And we won't go into the details of that. But the last step is to take the matter to the church. Well, obviously, he's not talking about the worldwide body. We don't have to communicate that difficulty to people living in Asia or people living in England or whatever. But the local congregation can help to solve that matter. So there is this local sense in which the word church is used. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that he would build his church and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. That's talking about the worldwide body of believers. He was going to build one church. Ephesians 4.4 4 says there's one body. Mm-hmm. And Paul makes it clear in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, that that's the church. So the one body is the church. And another reference on that would be Colossians 1, 18 and 24, where Christ's church is his body, and there is only one of those. Obviously, if you think about the metaphor of a body with Christ as the head, which is what Ephesians one twenty two says, Christ is the head, it would be a monstrosity if you had one head with multiple bodies or one body with multiple heads. That would just be ridiculous. There's one body, the church, with one head, Jesus. That's the worldwide sense. But, of course, we meet in different locations. You know, it's kind of interesting when you, when you see the meeting, and, and I, I, I want to get to this a little bit later on about the saints who are assembling together you right. know, because the essentiality. And, and I think when you look at the church in the local sense, a person has an opportunity. You know, I may not be able to participate worldwide. OK, I may not, I mean, I'm not, in, as you said, in Asia or England. So if I'm going to be in the church is there something significant about placing membership or being a part yes. of a local church? Yes. Well, in Acts 9, verses 26 uh-huh. through 28, we read about where somebody attempted to place membership uh-huh. with the congregation at Jerusalem. Would you like for us to read that? Yeah, that might be, be good for us yeah, to read it. Let's read look it. at Acts okay. chapter 9. Yeah. I'm going to read verses 26 through 28. Okay. And this is about Saul of Tarsus, uh-huh. who had recently been converted and had been preaching in Damascus. Right. It says, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. We call that placing membership. You could call it whatever you want. But he was trying to localize his service under the leadership of the Jerusalem congregation. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road 
That's earlier in chapter 9. And that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. So here's someone who says, I'm a Christian, but that doesn't mean I'm necessarily a member of any particular Mm -hmm. localized congregation. I may obey the gospel and then think about where do I want to worship? Where do I want to make my regular service to the church happen? And the New Testament plan, as you know, and as I'm sure many of your viewers know, the New Testament plan for Christians is that we work together in a local congregational context. That's why Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey those who have the rule over you, referencing elders. And that's why the leadership structure is portrayed in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, where you have elders and deacons and members. Philippians 1 and verse 1 Mm -hmm. shows us that leadership structure while Paul writes Mm -hmm. to the church at Philippi with the elders and the deacons and the rest of the members. And so it would be wrong for a Christian to say, I just want to be floating from one Mm -hmm. congregation to the next, never settling down in one place, never being a part of a flock over which local shepherds serve as overseers, as Peter explained they should in 1 Peter 5. One and two, he said, shepherd the flock which is among you. Well, am I a member of a flock anywhere where the shepherds are watching out for my souls? That needs to happen. So I need to take the initiative to let some congregation know I'm going to be working with the members here. That is a very good point. I was thinking as you were discussing that, I was thinking of Luke chapter 15. Mm -hmm. You know, a sheep was lost. Right. Okay. So we left the 99 and go in search of the one that was lost. Now, if they didn't know that sheep was a part of the fold, how are they going to know the sheep's lost? That's right. And, and, and go out in search of that. So it's essential that an individual become a part of a local church because it gives them, number one, the opportunity to be overseen and helps someone guide them in their spiritual growth. Yes. And it helps them in their participation of, course. Uh, of, of saving souls and of the work of the church. You know, sometimes, as you know this, if, you, if something is left just in general, it's never going to get done. Got to have a specific thing. So when you look at the local church and you look at the benefits of it, mm-hmm. what do you think... Just maybe in a couple of reasons. Why do people, why are there some who may not want to do that, place their membership with a congregation or be a part of that? What would be some of the things that you would well, think in this? I can't read people's hearts as Jesus could in John two twenty five. but I remember one lady I was speaking with who told me she could never be a member of a local congregation because she couldn't get along with people long yeah. enough to do that. And it seems that there are some who don't want to be overseen by elders. They don't want to have anybody watching out for their souls because they would like to keep some sins, personal sins, thriving in their lives, and they don't want anybody intruding on that. But, of course, shepherds are going to try to help the sheep be healthy. Sure, Shepherds are going to try to get people out of sin. But if someone wants to stay in sin, then he won't want that. Or maybe somebody just wants to be lazy. It's easy to say, I'm a Christian in my heart and personally, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to, for example, be given a sheet where I have to say, here are some areas where I'm willing to serve and check off, well, will I teach a Bible class? Will I participate in the benevolence program? Will I help clean the building? Will I do this or that area of service where, you know, at our congregation where I preach, every member gets a service opportunities worksheet and they put their name on it and they say, here are the areas where I feel I would be equipped to serve. And of course, I trust all of them would be willing to serve in any area, but there are some areas where we're better equipped. You know, I'm not very good at teaching little children's Bible classes, Mm -hmm. so I don't check that one. Although if they asked me to, I would, but that's just not my field. But we need to be able to have in our minds that I'm a servant. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that he came to serve. And Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. And so if I'm willing to serve, the context in which I will do most of my Christian service will be that local congregation. Remember, we said there's one body, one Mm -hmm. worldwide body of the saved. But in 1 Corinthians 14 and in Ephesians 4, 
that body, I should say 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, the local church is referred to as a body mm -hmm. because Paul goes into the different roles that various people play in a local congregation and says we're members of one another. And the way we support one another and encourage one another is by being with one another right. in a local setting. Well, I thought of it in Ephesians 4, for, you know, he makes this statement, for whom the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Yes, every joint supplies something. When you think about how that the body functions, how your and my body, how our body functions, the Bible is just covered with opportunities to illustrate the church as a body and how it should function uh, right. in that respect. You know, it's kind of interesting. In the last 20 months, well, we have, churches have suffered. We, yes. You know, because so many folks have not attended, they fail to attend. You know, I, what, what would be your reaction? I mean, in Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, how do you respond to those verses with folks in terms of their needing to be a part of the assembly? Well, let's say what those verses say, and then okay. we can talk about it. Verse 24 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And then the writer of Hebrews says in verse 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the habit or custom of some is, but exhorting one another or encouraging one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching. So part of how... Christians are to stimulate one another to love and good works is by assembling, and even we could be stronger than that, not forsaking Thank you. assembling, which would mean not choosing to be somewhere else mm -hmm. rather than to assemble. Of course, there are times when we're unable to be there because of sickness or because of caring for someone who's sick or because of taking a reasonable precaution mm -hmm. not to spread contagion. However, the assembly must be a priority. And it's been very disheartening to me that during the course of the pandemic, there have been some in the religious world who have celebrated yeah. the church not assembling. Okay. Let, me, let me read a quotation you, to you okay. from the Oklahoman newspaper. Okay. This was a, an editorial. Yeah. It said, due to COVID-19, the church is empty like Jesus' tomb. It's sort of like Elvis has left the building because the church, the called out ones from the Greek word for church, ecclesia, that, that's their yeah. words. They're saying exactly what we said on that. The church, they say, has left the building to do God's work in the world. Now, now notice the last part. Now we've been loosed on the world to be the church. And I find that very offensive because what they're saying is we can just get the assembly out of the way and now go do what God wanted us to do, as if the assembly was our impediment to being the church. When the assembly is a gift from God for us to right. worship and praise Him and should motivate us to go out into the world and do what God commanded us to do, far from being the only thing that was stopping us yeah. from doing Christian work, the assembly should motivate it. Or here's a website that is ostensibly dedicated to discipling marketplace leaders. That's what the description is, discipling marketplace leaders. And they say this, and I quote, The church has left the building in most parts of the world, but the church has not ceased to exist. We have been preaching for years that the church is the people of God, the called out ones, and now we get to practice what we preach. As if before COVID, the church couldn't practice what it preached because we were assembling. I heard of one congregation in another state where they were canceling one of their assemblies and the way that the leadership presented it. I know this because I know somebody who was in the assembly when this happened, but the, the leadership presented this cancellation to the church as an opportunity for greater service when really what they were doing was just compromising with people's laziness yeah. who yeah. didn't want to come. The assembly is such a priority. And while we understand that there has been a time where people have to make reasonable decisions for their health and for the health of their families, we must not organize our priorities in such a way that we would resume public life in all these other areas. Maybe we'll go to the grocery store and we'll go to the library and we'll go to a concert and we'll go to all kinds of public places. 
but we just don't come back to church. What does that say about our commitment to the church? The, the word church is used not only to refer to the universal body of the mm -hmm. saved and to local congregations, but even more specifically to the assembly of a local right. congregation. That's how it is in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 11 and 8. And there are other words like assembly and gathering that are used in passages like James 2, 2 and Hebrews 12, 22 that indicate the gathering of the local church. You know, the Lithia Springs Church exists even when it's not assembled. That's right. Like right now, yeah. the church at Lithia Springs is not assembled as we're here recording this program, but they will assemble later. They're the church whether they're assembled or not. Sometimes we have the assembly of the church. In fact, we have it every first day of the week, mm -hmm. and we have it a midweek Bible study. We have other occasions when we assemble, and we must not forsake that assembling. And that's part of how we stimulate one another to love and good works. So each person has to do personal inventory in his own heart, check himself, see whether he's in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and say, do I honor God's command to not forsake the assembly, to not choose to be elsewhere when the assembly is occurring? Well, you know, it was interesting when, when the pandemic started, someone whom I know, I know, and posted on Facebook, and they had, they were in their robe, the children covered up with a blanket, laying on the couch, and they had their, you know, their computer there, laptop, and they, they were saying, how wonderful this is. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not worship. Worship is directed to God. Mm. And we draw and off of each other. You know, when the Bible talks about singing, mm -hmm. teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And it, I fear that that we have created, that, well, let me say not we, that something has been created mm. that has damaged the spirituality of a lot of people. Am I, am I correct? I think so. At Lakeside, where I preach, we have wonderful, strong elders who have made provision uh -huh for people's health concerns during the pandemic. Right. We have a live stream. We had that before, right. but we reemphasize right. the fact that we have this live stream. And then they had they instituted a mask only uh -huh. service uh -huh. where and it meets at the same time as our worship in the auditorium. Uh -huh. They're just down in the fellowship hall and they stream the sermon from the mm -hmm. auditorium yeah. to the fellowship right. hall and they sing together and so they made some accommodations for that. But at the same time they said, and they encouraged me to say from the pulpit, that live streaming at home is not the same thing as assembling with the saints. That's, it's, you, know, you can worship wherever you are. You can yeah. worship at home or wherever, yeah. but just because you're live streaming, that doesn't mean you're assembling with the saints. Those are two different concepts. And if we mix those up and say, well, I'm assembling, I'm, I'm watching in my bedroom, yeah. I'm watching on the couch, you know, I got the football game yeah. going over here. I'm, I'm watching on yeah. my computer, <laughs> yeah. whatever the yeah. case may be. If a person says watching on the live stream is just as good as assembling, or maybe they even say it is assembling, then that really negates what the Bible says about the great benefits of being together in the same place. You know, you were thinking yeah. of Ephesians 5.19, yeah, right. where we're speaking to one, one another right. in those psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And Colossians 3, 16 says we're admonishing one another, mm -hmm. keeping one another accountable to God through those songs. You know, I think one of the things, the side effects of what's going on has been when folk used to go on vacation, mm -hmm. they would find a congregation with right. which to ascend. They don't do that now. Isn't that sad? That's sad. Uh, you know, and as a result of that, uh, you know, I've been up to Gatlinburg and some other places, and, you know, this is what has happened. You know what? We could, I'd love to have about another three or four hours with this. It's great to talk uh, about the church. It, it, isn't it? it really is, but it's great to have you. You do, you know, we just, we love and appreciate your work and uh, what you're doing. Uh, I mean, you, you are doing a lot. Of, Folks can go, for an example, Apologetic Express. They can go to your yeah. website, you know, calebcolley.com, because there's just so much there, folks. We love to study God's Word, don't we? It's been great. We're just delighted to have you with Thank us. Thank you for and, having and me. It's just great. 
We thank you for being a part of our program today. May God bless you. Speaking on this program is Jim Dearman. Mark Twain once defined civilization as a limitless multiplication of unnecessary necessities. It would be difficult to deny that we are threatened by things when we consider that 100 years ago the average citizen had 72 wants and rated only 16 of the 72 as necessities. In contrast, the average citizen today has 484 wants with 94 of them considered necessities. Is America being consumed by consumption? Of course, not all things are bad. 1 Timothy 6.17 reminds us that God gives us richly all things to enjoy. However, God's Word warns that things can threaten our souls. John warns, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The solution to the problem of things is found in seeking those things which are above. I'm Jim Dearman with a brief message of truth for the world. Speech on. Accessories and scenes you added. Living, living, music selected. Screen Calculator. Timer. Selected. Music record. Selected.